Um, so I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're going to do. We're talking about our growing faithful families. Uh, we're adding our milestones to this piece component. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll lay over and, and give you a broad overview of what and why we are where we're at today. Um, so that'll be our, our game plan. And then we'll also introduce uh, to you just in brief what you're expected to see at particular age groups um, as far as that goes. Good. Glad to see you guys all here today. Um, really, I, I'm hoping you take this as, as, very, enc as very encouraging. Um, that's how it's meant to be uh, led forward. Uh, so hopefully you're, uh, you're taking it that way and not feeling um, attacked or um, something along the lines of that. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this is a working together kind of thing. All right, so our Growing Faithful Families, this is uh, our logo that we created uh, during the pandemic time for this. Um, I cannot take credit for the Growing Faithful Families. Uh, that was mostly the work of Deaconess Kim and Kathleen and, and maybe other staff that were uh, throwing in ideas on there to getting something that was catchy for St. Stephen. All right, so Lutherans have always emphasized Lutheran education. So schools, uh, midweek programs, Sunday school, uh, St. Stephen has a long tradition of supporting Lutheran education here. Um, I, I know at times our Sunday school folks have felt like, oh, you know, we're, we're not like great. And I, I always reassure them, hey, I go to pastor's conferences and I talk to that. And I tell them the number of kids that we have in our programs. And they're like, that's a great program. Um, there's a lot of churches in our, in our church body that have totally abandoned Sunday school on Sunday morning. Um, those have gone away. Uh, St. Stephen, I commend you for that kind of way moving forward. Um, even with our pandemic time when we uh, were going to three services, um, the elders wanted to not go back to a three service system, even if you know the numbers would suggest it would go back there. We would return to our original plan of knocking the wall out and going to 540 uh, seats before we would give up that education hour because we want to emphasize education here at St. Stephen. Okay, um, so again, we support Lutheran High School of Kansas City. We support Martin Luther Academy. Um, we continue to try to strive to do as best as we can for our Sunday school program, and I really appreciate uh, the efforts of our Board of Youth um, and Deaconess Kim and, and uh, Kathleen and all that everybody does to support those, not to mention the many people that, that work and, and teach in those particular areas. So it's, it's a blessing that we have. We have uh, adults that are still teaching, in confirmation class and other classes, um, and they don't even have kids in Sunday school. They haven't had them forever, so everybody can be a part. All right, so while we have enjoyed a thriving Sunday school program over the years, we, like most churches, have experienced challenges, right? So can you name a few challenges? What are those? What are our challenges? What's finding teachers, volunteers, right? What else? Keeping kids involved. Keeping kids involved, yeah. Keeping parents involved. Keeping parents involved, yep. What are some other things? Yeah. Keeping babies involved. Yes, I like it. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, some of the things that I've, you know, also touched on a little bit are like time. Um, you know, time is an issue because... We have a lot of competing things for our time, even now on Sunday morning, which used to be sacred. Wednesday evening, same kind of thing, used to be sacred. Um, those are no longer the case. Um, regular church attendance today is defined as church once a month. That's not great. That's not great. So we got to, you know, try to get a little better at that type of thing, too. Um, money. I mean, money is an issue, too. Uh, we are... So used, I'll use this term of outsourcing, right? So we have gotten so used to outsourcing things in, in America, we're really good at this, right? What does outsourcing mean? It's like we pay people to clean our houses. Uh, we pay people to teach our kids, you know, um, as far as like if they're struggling in an area of school, we pay people to, to do these things. We pay people uh, to train our kids to be the best athletes in the world, right? We train and we spend a lot of money on that. And, and frankly... Um, a church of our side does not have the luxury of just being able to, to pay for everything that we would want to do here at the church. We depend on a lot of, um, of that sort of things, right? So very good. Um, my guess is that we are not likely to change the trend and pattern unless we try something different. 
I, don't, I mean, I, I know you guys probably have heard these statements before. Um, so again, my encouragement today is for you to join us in making a change, right? But you know the, you know the madness, right? The, the, you can't do the same thing that you've been doing and expect to get different results. And the results that I'm talking about that I want to see change, and I hope that you feel a passion in this regard too, is that our kids, when they get through our Sunday school programs, sometimes we lose them after confirmation. Uh, most likely we lose them after high school if they stick around for that time. Um, kids are challenged when they go to colleges. Um, I, I, you know, I, I go to pastors' conferences where we have we have fellow pastors um, in in our church. They're they're all, they're also struggling with these things too. Their kids have completely walked away from the faith. Um, this is worth investing something in. All right? Do we kind of agree with this? I mean, yeah. This is something that we want to see changed. All right. So again. Um, the challenge, including ours, has been a mistake <laughs> by taking the responsibility of teaching the faith. So our church, uh, this is an important thing for us to kind of understand, and we'll get back to it a little bit later. Um, but the church has a big responsibility in, in creating this problem of, you know, outsourcing, right? Um, for a long time, our churches have said, we will teach your children the faith, all you need to do is bring them here to church, and we will do that, okay? That's, an, that's called an institutional model for teaching the faith. What we have to remember is that is not a biblical model. It's not a biblical model. Um, even, uh, you know, this is something really new in the church, the idea that, we would, that, that you would entrust your faith to, to a pastor or to a church leader or something along the lines of that. That's completely new. And a lot of it is based upon this outsourcing idea, right? You would not trust your kids with a lot of things <laughs> when it comes to raising them in the way that you would want to go. Not sure why we bought into this um, for the church and its experience that way, okay? So again, it, it's, uh, we're, we're just trying to say, hey, let's walk away from what's in the past. Let's march towards something that is new. So uh, the biblical model, right, is that we teach the faith in the home. And even in our catechism, Dr. Martin Luther, well, the name that we're Lutherans named after, he always says, as the head of the household should teach his family, right? As the head of the household should teach. And that's this little you know, book right here. Now, I'm not saying we're going to ditch the confirmation program that's here, but I just want you guys to take that seriously and hear what that's saying. As the head of the household should teach um, his children moving forward. All right, so um, wanting to get back to more of a, a, a biblical model on how we do this and how we focus in on this here. All right, so Growing Faithful Families is our Team Jesus effort to change this pattern. So Growing Faithful Families, this program that's right here, is something we began during the pandemic. Um, again, why did we do that? Why did we need to start something different? Well, because you guys weren't here, right? I mean, you weren't here. You were not in church. We were out of church for a long time uh, from the beginning of the pandemic to uh, the Sunday after Mother's Day. That was a gigantic gap. And, and all of a sudden, you didn't have the places to go that was here. So we started this Growing Faithful Families to get stuff out to your kids or to the families so that they could pick this up at home. Unfortunately, sometimes when I called, you know, that it was just, you know, nobody was doing anything. And that's just not how that should be. Um, church should not be dependent upon whether or not we can get here, right? Church is an important aspect of our life, and it's something that we're doing each and every day. So we started it during that time, and it was something just as simple as saying, hey, why don't you just do family devotions? And we were trying to track that information, and we were just asking for people to give a little feedback in that regard. Um, and so that's where the idea got going. Um, but what I want you to understand is growing faithful family is not a new idea, right? Growing faithful families is our name for a movement that is in our church body that we will talk about today. So I want you to understand that this is not its own made-up program. This is not falling out of the sky. Um, I wasn't, you, you know, um, Joseph Smith that got hit on the head with a golden plate and it had it on here, do this. That's not what it was all about. Um, rather, it's part of a movement that has been around even in our church body for decades. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that now. 
So in 2007, while I was at the National Youth Gathering in Orlando, so if you remember back that far, I was a vicar when I left, and I was uh, not anything by the end of it because my vicarage had run out, and I was going to be in, um, you know, installed and ordained as pastor in that, that time frame. So anyway, um, when we were at the National Youth Gathering, I went to an adult sectional that was led by a game named, guy named Ben Freudenberg. And at that time, he was with the Family Friendly Partners Network. That is still in existence today. Um, that Family Friendly Partners Network, Network is still in existence today. And they still do the same thing that they were doing back in 2006 when they were presenting at the National Youth Gathering. And what, you know, their words on what they're trying to do is basically trying to change the church culture to embrace these ideas and how you can grab onto them. Now, at that time, you know, I, I, I really wish I would have pushed that a little bit better, but I'm not sure that a vicar coming back from National Youth Gathering would have convinced the congregation to spend $6,000 to bring a group in to make a change. Now, you know, we had a lot that we're, we were trying to work through and all that kind of stuff, um, but looking back now, I wish that we would have, you know, done that because, again, it would have began a paradigm shift within our church to understand and grab onto these kind of concepts. All right, so I think that this is important um, for us to, you know, to kind of focus on. And again, like I said, the past is water, you know, over the dam, so let's not worry about too much on this. So um, the next slide here, this is Ben Freudenberg. He now is with the Concordia Center for the Family, um, which is not really, they're not doing anything different than what they were doing um, with the Family Friendly Partners Network. I just think that he is getting a little bit, later in life, and he's, he's almost to the point where he's saying, you know what, I don't have to make money off of doing this anymore. Um, this is not my primary thing, but I want to give as many people as I can uh, the information that I've collected in my brain over the years um, to give it to you. So I'm going to show you a video right now that kind of highlights this. Families in my congregation are really struggling and wanting to know more about how do we handle what's going on in the world today from a Christian perspective. So many have grown up with uh, divorce and brokenness in their home uh, that they really feel like uh, they, they didn't have the example that they wanted. I think that families in my congregation are struggling with um, getting caught up in the fast-paced moving society that we live in today. Marriage enrichment is really a, a huge need in, in my congregation. I'm Ben Freudenberg, the director of the Concordia Center for the Family, and I've been working with children, youth, and their families for 44 years. Concordia Center for the Family exists to raise the capacity of your congregation or community agency to help healthy families stay strong. We seek to instill in the leaders of church and community organizations the necessary knowledge, skills, and attitudes and practices so that the families they serve, the families you serve, will have what they need not only to weather, but to grow stronger through the storms of everyday family living. Our website is designed to be a hub for you to connect with many resources and ideas in family life education and ministry. We hope you enjoy and will benefit from your exploration of its content. We invite you to become a prayer partner, receive our newsletter, or join us on Facebook or Twitter. Together, we can change the world one family at a time. All right, so just a really kind of a simple idea, and I love it. And so again, I'm not I'm not throwing you a sales pitch because it's probably about 12 grand or more right now to bring somebody like these guys in from the outside. So rather than that, what I'm trying to kind of explain is that right now we're really at a great position because we can leverage these years of experience, a lot of great information and self-helps, and better yet, we can take advantage of a lot of this information and the tools that are needed to kind of implement this as we will walk through a little bit more that we've been given on the expense of the Missouri District because the Missouri District has also been partnering um, with Ben Freudenberg and other people like that and to really put an emphasis on the families. And so the district, this is one of their primary things. They've just gone through a similar thing like what we're going through with our ministry clarity process. The district went through one of these things too. And this is one of the things that they're trying to work on with the congregations that are there. So we already have 
mentor pastors that would be available to us um, that are there. Uh, Deaconess Kim, myself, um, Kathleen, who else went? Did Sydney go? I can't remember if you went. No, maybe she did. She looked at me. We went down to St. Matthew because that's where one of the pastors, Pastor Andrews, is there. Um, he is implementing this for the district side. And most of the stuff that are here, we've, we pretty much got from him. And it's already being used and tried not only in his congregation, but in congregations across the country. And another cool thing about it is that these are also tied um, to the Kingdom Quest stuff that we've already been using. Not that curriculum is a, is a challenge with that, um, because it doesn't really matter about the curriculum. Again, what matters is getting the faith into the homes. All right, so ultimately, <laughs> this is ultimately what we're, we're talking about, right? Why, why change at this point? So why change? And, and I think we can all agree that we want our kids to be with us in heaven, right? Right now, we've been following this institutional model of Christian education, as I was talking about. Again, that means we believing that it's the church's responsibility to church, teach our kids the faith, and we, our job is simply to bring them there. No, we want to change this because we want to, that we want to have parents be the primary faith former, um, and the family is crucial. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that's important and a little bit of the research that's out there to help, help us you know, go in that way. All right, so let's read this together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall not find them, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you off the face of the earth. Yeah, it ends with a real good gospel promise there, right? <laughs> but whom, whom is Moses speaking to here? Who is, who is he, whom is he speaking to? Right? The... Well, he is standing at the children of Israel. It's just after they've been like, you know, rescued by a God through the, the flood, right? So, or not the flood, the, um, the parting of the Red Sea. So this is the deliverance from Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh's army has just been destroyed behind him, and we're standing on this, this epic moment, right? It's this epic moment, and, and who is, or uh, whom is, is Moses speaking to at this point, though? Parents, right? Grandparents, children, Everyone, right? Even singles, probably, right? He's speaking to everybody that's standing there on the edge that have just been saved and are about to head in. All right, so would you say that the Lord thinks that teaching the faith is important? Ah, okay, yeah. All right, good. We're all in agreement on something like that. And, you know, and again, we, we want our children to be in heaven. This is what's important. We want them to remember who God is and that in this life, especially today, right, in this life, their rescue, their help comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from the latest and greatest movement in our church or in the world. It doesn't come from sports. It doesn't come from this, doesn't come from that. It comes from the Lord only. He is our only God, and everything that we set up that stands in the way of this is a false God that, that he's talking about there. All right, so we want our kids to be in heaven 
with us. That, that's what we want. We are Team Jesus, joyfully empowering others to be Christ followers. Now, you know, we're going to unpack this a little bit more over this year that's coming up because we've got a, a meeting that's going to be scheduled and we're going to get our teams moving and we're really going to dive into this and we're going to have a, a sermon series on this and Bible classes on this and you'll be hearing a lot more about um, our guiding statement, our pillars and those types of things that are to come. Um, but what I don't want you to miss on this is that sometimes when the word others pops out there, right, helping others, who, who are the others that we're talking about in this statement? See, because I think a lot of times when a church thinks about missions, what do they think about? What do they think? When I say missions, what are they thinking about? Overseas, right? And how many of you guys are ready to go overseas to do mission work? Now, how many of you would send your money to do that? Yeah, probably some of you, right? I mean, that we, I mean, that's why there's probably more Christians in Africa and China than there are in the United States anymore, because we are a very generous people, and we, there's a lot of people that want the gospel being spread throughout the world. But the others, for our Teen Jesus family, who, is, who are we talking about there? Everyone, yeah. Who else? Children. Who's, ch who's children mainly? Your child. See, this is what I want us to kind of get focused in on. So, so are you following me on this, though, on this others? Do you, do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Because, again, I, I mean, my influence in my God-given responsibilities, I am primarily responsible for my faith relationship with Jesus. That's nobody else but me, right? That is God's design. That that's my first priority is keeping my relationship with Jesus sound. Then my second God-given responsibility is to my wife. My third would be my kids, my grandkids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on that list coming down is my vocation as pastor. I, I want you to see that, how important that is for you to understand this, is that our vocational responsibilities and this following Christ, teaching others to follow Christ, this is what you need to do for your children first and foremost, Right? that can't be given at the expense of anything else in this life. Are we clear on that? Any questions on that? Because I think if we're missing this point, we're never going to get this change going. And we've got to get this change going. All right, any questions on that? All right, so in our pillars, which will be coming out soon, that you'll be able to see, one of our pillars is family. And again, that's something that was worked through with, uh, with our guiding process. That's something that I worked with Pastor Frith, who is leading us through this transition thing. Um, family is one of those names that, that kept popping up and that we and our visioning team came through with, that this is a primary importance here at St. Stephen. So family, again, is going to be a gigantic pillar. And I want to reinforce this idea that this family, as we're talking about our family. Yes, we are talking about our church family, and, and I, I agree with that 100%, but we've got to get this very clear that our primary responsibility is to be the one that's leading the example in our faith walk with our children, okay? Any questions? Am I not clear on this? All right, so hopefully we're, we're getting this through. Okay, our church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, recently put out a study from research they did, including the National Youth Gathering that I previously mentioned, they were gathering this information from those kids at that time. So I want to share a few statements from the executive summary that I think are helpful for us to understand how we can be a part of this particular change. So in this, in this regard, again, um, what they were doing is they were surveying kids at the National Youth Gathering, and they were following them all the way through their adult life and still got these kids to kind of respond back. What they found is the data that they received from this and the willingness for these kids to kind of do this and follow through with this is, is pretty amazing because it's really cool because these are like my kids' age 
people that were responding to these particular surveys. I will put links, so this presentation is gonna get put on our Facebook page, or I mean our YouTube page, and we'll have a, a, a specific section for this. We'll give you links to all of this data if you wanna read a little deeper into this. And they've actually put out an entire book, which uh, I'm requiring all of our staff to read, you know, so that they really truly understand the meat behind why we are doing this and why it matters. All right, so here's the first one. Parents and congregations must prepare for and engage young people during time of transitions and crisis. Only 55% of active LCMS young adults agree that their home congregation ministered to them during times of life transitions. You can look at that both positively and negatively, okay? And it really didn't matter on the size of congregations because some excel in some ways, like the bigger churches were able to provide youth workers and those types of things. But the other side of it is that the smaller congregations never lost track of where their kids are. They all knew where they were, right? Because, well, those of you that are from a small town, you know what that's like, right? You know that everybody knows your business and whatever they don't know, they'll make up. So that's how that works. So that's a good thing though, but it has advantages, right? So um, again, this is where we're going with the milestones, as we'll talk about that in a little bit more uh, detail here. All right, so that was number one. Um, number two, ministry should prior, prioritize long-term relationships, embracing its particular context. We recognize that the data does not speak to casualties. Casualty? Causality, sorry, yeah, there we go. The data does not speak to causality. However, it gives a strong indication that both strong resourcing for youth ministry and the presence of long-term relationships with church leaders has a positive impact on retention. Um, so what, what I mean by that, um, it, it's interesting in some of the studies that it is proven that like say you had a long-standing youth worker that worked with kids, that was certainly helpful in keeping some of those things uh, in connection there. But what the report also seemed to say was that these relationships don't necessarily have to be from a called worker perspective. They can be a trusted parent or individual that you know has kept them close or that they've kept in contact with or something along the lines of that as time went on. Um, I can speak to that with my own kids because I know that when they would come back from college, uh, they would be talking to some adults that they you know had connections with in that regard, and that was an easy transition for them. Many of you guys are that already for our kids, and I appreciate you guys keeping those connections and touches together with them. That's absolutely fantastic. We want to keep that up. But more importantly is we want to build that into our program. So at one of the st stages, these milestones, we're going to help you get these connections for your kids so that they're f you know, forming these bonds and relationships because we know that this works, you know, that the data shows that this, this kind of thing works. All right, next slide. Parents play a critical role in the young adult faith development and retention. Parents remain the number one person who impacts the faith lives of young people. Nearly three in four young adults, 72%, listed at least one parent as, the one, as one of the most influential people in their lives. So again, I hope you take that as encouragement. Um, this is a statistic that they found on there that those that are still engaged in church, that this was a big ticket item, that one of their parents was very much involved in that regard. All right, um, and, and this also goes to another point if, if we think about this. You guys are actually really good at discipling your children, right? Um, we... A lot of times, you know, like we grow up to be our parents. <laughs> so we have a, a huge influence by our parents and how we view life, how we, you know, do this, that, or the other, whatever it is. Um, so our parents have a huge impact on that. So that's why I want to make sure that we're really stressing the importance that your, parent, that your kids are seeing that faith is an important value in your life, okay? Um, you know, I remember one of our professors in pastoral ministry, right, when we were in a class, and he would, like, set us up. Have your, have your kids ever walked in on you in your room and caught you reading the Bible, he said. So 
you see, you see the connection there, hopefully. I don't want to explain too much detail on that, otherwise it would get crazy. But this is what we're talking about, right? Um, discipling, think about that. If, you're, if, you're, if your select team coach said you had to shoot 100 baskets a day um, for you to be on the team or you're not going to make the team, what do we do, right? We're good at modeling and doing these sort of things. And so it's not any different in this regard. This is the same type of thing. Whether it's sports or music or any activity, morals, character that we're teaching our kids, you guys are really good at this. And you can be really good at being a faith example for your child. Because God gave you the child, it's his child, and he's entrusted that to you. Okay, moving on. Engaging youth and young adults in service and leadership increases retention in the Lutheran Church, Missouri City. So they've found that. And so this has been kind of good. We're trying to work on different ways in which even after confirmation or high school that we can involve our kids in this. Um, I think our Hanging in the Green service does a great job on this. Um, our Christmas programs over the years have done that. It's not that long ago when we, had a, when we had a youth praise team that was very involved and active within our congregation. So um, we can make this as a priority of our church to make sure that our youth are being in those types of positions. Okay, yeah, so, so somebody that saw our, our Hanging of the Green service, their parents said they wish their church would still do this, this kind of thing. Okay, yeah, so they used to and it's gone away. And see, and I think that that's kind of a, a heavy importance on, on the way that we think about these sort of things because this may make us look a little different. I mean, I, I get the push for not wanting kids to be involved in that type of thing because it maybe it sends the wrong message or that's maybe what the pastor should be doing, I'm not saying we're going to have kids preaching or anything like that, but I'm just simply saying that, that if, if we're confirmed, right, there, there is responsibilities that we could be taking on in the church and that way they feel a little bit more plugged in. The other thing is, is young leadership. So in our ministry clarity process, I, I really appreciate it. We had, we had a, a bunch of millennials that were involved in, in helping us uh, determine these sort of things. Um, young, when we see young people in leadership positions, uh, that is a, a benchmark for when we see younger people in our congregations in that way too. All right, any other good comments or questions at this point? All right, um, congregations must be safe places for young people to wrestle with life and faith in order for them to faithfully reach out to today's culture. Um, so I, 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 you know, we have to think about how we do all this kind of stuff, but I, um, and, and Vicar's really been helping out quite a bit with the praise team, uh, so we haven't been teaching as much um, in the confirmation class, but I found it, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say it, it's funny, but this is how confirmation goes. So the, the time that I was in with the confirmation kids class this year, guess what they wanted to talk about? They wanted to talk about creation, right? Did this really happen? Did God really create the world in six days? So, so it's creation. What's another one? Suicide, right? Now, why are they asking these questions? <laughs> Because they're getting challenged on this, right? They're getting challenged on this, or it's something that's heavy on their heart, right? I mean, how many of our schools this year have had a suicide happen at them, right? Or an accidental death, or, or a teacher that passed away, right? You, these things happen, and this, they want answers for this kind of thing. And we've got to be making sure that we're a safe place for them to be able to ask those questions, and then also at the same time, you know, to try and do a, um, you know, try to do something that w will help them and give them this, the, the confidence that they can have to trust, you know, God's word on this particular thing. As a follow-up of that, Nate, I appreciate that. Nate's going to take the kids in that particular class uh, through a, a little bit of a creation thing from a biblical perspective, you know, and from a, a good perspective on that. See, these are just really good ways in which we can make sure that our kids are getting those questions that they're answering or wrestling with in today's thing. So, all right, any other, any other comments or thoughts on that? The one thing that's really encouraging on that is that our LCMS young adults that are still in church and doing those things, they are very strong in their faith. And I think that that's a, that's a cool thing. Um, it's a feather in our cap because we place a lot of emphasis upon education and, and being in the word 
and those kind of things. So, so we need to make sure we keep that going up. So that's a good thing that came out of the study too. All right, so I think you should read the book. All the stuff have read the book, talked about that. Um, the insight is significant. Now, to not change how we approach this based upon the data and research that we have been given is unconscionable, okay? So that's why I'm very firm on this. This is a hill I certainly will die on. Um, we have to change this. We have to change and flip the culture in our church to make a difference in our kids' lives, right? We have to do this right. Um, this is God's will for our church and for the sake of his children. It's, it's what he wants done. Um, and again, I fully expect obstacles in it in the sense that anytime you're going to do something that's going to get people more in the word, uh, strengthening our families and all that kind of stuff, Satan's going to go crazy, and he's been trying to attack a lot of this stuff from a lot of different angles, and just know who the real enemy is here, okay? We need to focus in on that. All right, encouragement from Teddy Roosevelt, right? It is hard to fail, but it is worse never to have tried to succeed. So that's where we're at today. All right, our Missouri district is going through the same process. I just talked about this a little bit more, um, but I wanted to read, I wanted you to see uh, this particular quote from one of the things that they had produced too. So it's train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Famous pro Proverbs quote, right? Many churches work hard to involve families, kids, and youth in the church. Congregational activities such as Palm Sunday processions, Lenten passion plays, and or Christmas pageants hold a special place in the hearts of many, not to mention the years of children's sermons, and Sunday school. While they can be helpful and fun for kids too, kids too often these activities become more of a cultural tradition than a means of instilling faith in the next generation. A great way to take faith formation a step further is for churches and families to work towards having at home family lessons and devotions. Okay, so again, this is from the Missouri district. This is what we've been trying to kind of put in play here. This is what we've been trying to kind of move toward. And so um, this, this is being uh, supported also by our, our district. Okay, one of the things um, that I'm particularly happy about, so um, when we went into the pandemic with our, uh, you know, at that time, um, this was one of our earliest attempts at trying to make sure we're reaching out to it. So our Small Saints program, um, we do a chapel um, once a week here with our you know, kids that come in um, for, for Small Saints program. So when, when, when we went into the pandemic, we began filming these along with our regular schedule um, that, that we had. And why is that? Well, earlier on, we had already been creating devotions for these families to take home. So our teachers would send them home with all of our preschool kids. They would be talked about what we had talked about in Bible class, at least it had been given to them. And it just gave them like a quick you know, this is a five-minute thing that you can talk about with your kids. So, like, God made the world, right? And so it's like, okay, take your kids outside, you know, show them the starry night and say, wow, isn't this beautiful, God's creation? Just something, you know, simple like that. So we had all these little things that we were hoping to kind of, um, you know, do on that, you know, when there was there. So it was kind of cool. I think it was, Liz, you were telling me that um, during the pandemic, uh, you guys were outside in the garage and they were watching because one of the neighbors was actually in the Small Saints program. And so they were doing these, you know, these videos that were out there. So it was kind of cool um, that we could do that. So we continued to do that and, and built that and continued that on to that next year. Many of you also know we already have Sunday school um, that's, that's also on there. Uh, the goal with that, again, is that nobody has to miss Sunday school. Nobody has to miss church. Everything we do is on YouTube. It's all out there. Um, you can access this stuff anytime you want. So you got a you got a soccer tournament up in Omaha, right? So you're driving back from Omaha. You got I know this road very well. So you got at least two hours in the car on the way home instead of watching, you know, Pocahontas or whatever you're watching now uh, for the fiftieth time. You could watch church and Bible in Sunday school on the way home and still might have time for a Barney or two. I know people don't do Barney, but I'm just remembering what I do with my kids. That's how I told them how much longer we had before we get to the place. It's five Barneys, then we'll be there. So they understood that. Then it was cool. So, all right. Um, so we send these, you know, devotions home. Um, we are talking about making this happen with Sunday school again. 
Um, so I think Robin was, was adding that element there that maybe we can, we can bring those back home because all of our Sunday school programs have just oodles and gobs of stuff that's behind them, and we could make all of this accessible to you guys. Um, it, it would be easy to do. Again, curriculum is not important. It's all about doing this family stuff in the home, instilling the faith in the home. Um, one, of, one of my favorite you know, examples on this is a children's guard to Bible stories. Um, that's what we use for our family devotions at home uh, when, when, my kids, when our kids were growing up. And so uh, when, when Joey went to, I think it was either kindergarten or first grade, um, it was at, at the Lutheran School in Sioux Falls, um, the teacher had mentioned to us that he would grab that book to read. You know, so it's like, again, it was just bringing comfort and it's something that they can hold on to. That's what we want with this, right? Um, so uh, this week while the kids were in town, um, again, we, we tried to do those family devotions together. We tried to do that. Um, we were using the, uh, child, it was using the Eggemeyer's book. I don't know if anybody even remembers the old Eggemeyer's book. The, it's got the entire Bible, right? And there's some that have pictures and stuff like that, so they're good little devotion books there too. So again, it's not a secret sauce. It's not a secret formula. It's just simple repetition and a repetition that you can do at home. Um, any questions on that at this point? All right, since we're kind of running a little bit low on time, um, I was going to practice do a, a devotion, um, you know, with the kids that are here, and uh, we probably won't get to the milestones if I do that. Um, but our, our practices was we always, you know, prayed, come Lord Jesus, before we would eat, and then after supper we would um, do what we would call return thanks. So what we would do at that time is we'd read a devotion. I'd oftentimes would have, like, use the questions in the back, and or make them up, and you know if they were a difficult question, I would call it a double dessert, you know, question or something like that. Just had fun with it, so that you know the kids were engaged in it and, and could get the questions and ask them. And it also helped me to make sure they were listening to what we were talking about too. And it helped them to stay focused on listening too, because well, who doesn't want double desserts, right? So um, that was a good way to do it. After we do the devotion and do the questions, and sometimes we would do like a favorite, least favorite things. So it's a good family time to just kind of get what's on the kids' minds uh, going on that day. Uh, favorite thing, least favorite thing, or however you want to kind of say it uh, in your own group. And then we'd pray the Lord's Prayer together, and then we would return thanks. So we'll give thanks on the Lord for his good. And then we would sometimes sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all, I know not everybody's a musical family. That's okay. Um, but find something that was, you know, that works uh, for, for you guys. It's, it's just important to make it a good bonding type of thing. All right, any questions up to that point on family devotions? And I can put a, I can do a video of a sample of that, that way you've got that too. Uh, we can get that online there too. All right, so Deaconess Kim is planning to produce a Milestones Bulletin, I think it is. Do we have that slide? Milestones, right? So here are the list of the milestones. I've got them here. Um, and we'll just run through them real quickly. So, and I might get them mixed up, but that's okay. Uh, the, age one is the living with the telos, right? So th this is, you're going to get a cross. And living with the telos just means living for the end result. So it's like, if you really focus in on that, right? It doesn't really matter what you're doing. You're wanting an end goal. And so with this family, you know, the Growing Faithful Families thing, the end goal is, the end goal is for us to have our kids in heaven. That's the end goal. That's where we want to go. That's where we want our kids to go. And so it's, it's, it's really basic in that way. Earlier on that, we usually send out pre-baptism or pre-birth or right around birth. This is just the baptismal booklet that we follow. And then, of course, you get a baptismal candle. And then we do the little lambs. So here's Dominic's little lambs. So we got to get this up to Wisconsin for Dom. We needed it for today's presentation, but we'll get up there. And then we got like a little candle thing too uh, that we connect with our baptism type of thing and the telos. All right, and so this uh, living with the telos for age one, um, I'll be doing that with, uh, you probably have gotten an email. If you didn't get an email, let me know. But that's next Saturday at 10 o'clock. We're going to gather here and go through uh, that particular step. So all the parents are invited with their you know, kids. We're going to have babysitting for that. 
Most of these programs will have babysitting all the way up to, I think, kindergarten. And then at kindergarten, we want the kids in with the parents when we do these things. So we'll have uh, a special class for all of these things um, to do those. We'll make sure that we can record them because we know that we won't always get everybody there. But that way, you can at least have some resource to gather um, back with that. Um, second one, H2, is uh, Scripture Prayer to Family Blessing Books. So I think that's the Bible Storybook. Little hands. Um, so again, these are, are good things for you to start doing. Um, in a couple of the children's messages that I've done in the, over the past year, um, I've given you the little arch books. Do you guys know the little arch books? Um, those are from Concordia Publishing House. Um, buy them for your grandkids. Buy them for your kids. It's just little books. Briefly overview a, a biblical story. Um, you should at least make sure you for sure have the Easter ones and the Christmas ones because they're very helpful. Um, and read them to your kids, right? Uh, taking Sunday school at home. Um, this is the baptismal lambs and the little visits with Jesus. So you get this book at that time. Our next guy is uh, God and Music Children's Bible Song Book. I don't think I have that one up yet. And then what's the next one? Uh, worship Prayer in Our Church. That'll be a worship kit. We're also going to try to get a chest. So we'll have chests for everybody to put their... Um, stuff in, so it'll be a nice little chest. You can take that home. You can paint that. The child gets, you know, participates in painting that or whatever, and then you can keep all that stuff in there. Um, we're, we'll be adding that into that pick, mix too. What do we got next? Uh, my first catechism. Um, that's right here. It introduces us to the the chief parts of the catechism and connects them to a really good story that helps to illustrate, um, you know, one of the the. Um, anchors of the faith. Uh, next thing we got is uh, Time, Talents, Treasure, and Telling Craft. So again, that's connected with our Consecrated Stewards series that we do here on a regular basis for our adults. So this is just kind of bringing that down into a level uh, for our young people. Next one is be uh, a serving platter, hospitality and generosity. Uh, so it's got ways to kind of work through all these things and we'll do these um, with you in the Groups explain a little bit more what we mean by those types of things. Uh, technology contract, uh, boy, th this is really needed um, today. Um, we can we can track this information. Uh, when I was doing my presentation at the Missouri District on the online worship and the importance of of how you need to mirror and continue this even after the pandemic, um, you, you can either pull away from it or you can you know, go into it, but I think we have to be able to walk through with this. Um, just between the ages of my son, Joey, and Elizabeth, because of the introduction of what this social media has done, uh, this is, you got to be aware of this, this is what's causing a lot of crisis for a lot of our youth, um, because they have trouble unplugging, um, and, and this is not good, and so it'll be helpful to, to kind of make sure you're educating and teaching and doing those types of things you know, on a good regular basis. If you're not checking their social media, not to get on a high horse right now, but you need to be on your kids' phones. Um, that's, you're the ones that are paying the bill. You should be able to see what's on their phones. Make sure you're checking it. Fifth grade, uh, Faith Alive Bible. There you go, Faith Alive Bible. And that's fifth grade also in our church, they go through the Bible. Um, then sixth grade to get a catechism, I think. Yep, small catechism as we begin our confirmation program. Um, then what's the next one? Purity contract. I don't have that up here, but this is a pretty a big thing. We'll probably connect that with watching um, the sex lady, right? Do her kit, but it would be good if you guys are all in there together to watch Pam Stenzel do her thing on it because, again, most kids are concerned about getting pregnant that are having sex before they're getting married, um, but that's really the least of their worries because you really can't die from that, but there's a lot of things that you can screw up for the rest of your life with that. Uh, so we, we're going to have that at seventh grade. Next one is uh, stress, anxiety, depression, and suicide, clinging to uh, Christ's stress ball. I don't have that here, but I got a stress ball in my office. What's next? Ninth grade journal and pen. Um, and the pen's got a cool uh, read, listen, grow. So they can journal with their faith walk in that grade. And then the keychain. Um, enjoy the ride, right? So we got a little keychain for him. It says Team Jesus on it. Enjoy the ride. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, a 
carabiner. So it's like a, a connection thing, keeping God in your relationship. So it's a, a hook that of sorts. And then you could, I think Deaconess Kim calls it the cabineer, which means the bearer of it, right? Okay, yeah, when I Googled carab carabiner near, it seemed like the bearer of something, of a weapon too. So I like that analogy either. Go with whatever you want to go with. So, All right, and then 12th grade, sticky Bible tabs. Um, we'll have that uh, for them too. So it's just uh, something that they get ready to take with them to college. So, All right, any questions on that, on that, on that aspect of it? All right, well, I went a little bit over, so I didn't leave you any time for asking tough questions. But no, we are free to answer any of the questions you have. I said Kathleen and, and Deaconess Kim in the back are, are really uh, the ones that put together this, this uh, milestone kind of stuff. So if you have any questions about it, feel free to give them a call. Um, you know, anytime, if you're not able to make these when they're scheduled, uh, please let us know. We'll follow up with that. Uh, you guys are fortunate you're not going to get a call from one of us because you didn't miss it. Um, so there you go. Yeah, Deaconess Kim, you had something to say too? Oh, what? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight the main reason that we're doing all of these milestones is to get every peer group together once a year. So you're also getting that fellowship within the church. Your kids are meeting peer, their peers. You're meeting the parents of the peers. So we're all supporting and building up this faith community because we want to encourage you to be doing this faith stuff at home. But it's hard to do it by yourself. That's the whole point is to build this community so you know who your people are and are getting that support as well. So that's why we're trying to meet every age group at least once a year. So, All right, yeah, thanks. Um, and again, we probably missed out something, but we'll, we'll try to make sure we follow up. So, All right, again, thanks, thanks for showing up today. That's, it's really encouraging, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and have a great week in the Lord, and 